Okay, so welcome everyone to the BAPT conference uh, entitled The New Normal, People Type and the Post-Pandemic World. I'm delighted to introduce Dario Nardi, who will be uh, presenting brains and type variants around the world. Uh, Dario focuses on neuroscience, personality and body-mind practices. His books include Neuroscience of Personality, Jung on Yoga and The Magic Diamond. He uses EEG for brain imaging and created the CPA, a highly validated assessment of the eight uh, Jungian functions. So welcome, Dario, and over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for all of you coming and for all of you who are um, listening in, you know, after afterwards, whenever you can possibly make it. So uh, yeah, what are we going to talk about today? Um, trying to clean up the interface here in the process. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, brains around the world. As I've been collecting brain imaging data and uh, demographic data, uh, type data about people, it's been in different countries. And then there's this interesting question, you know, bringing that, analyzing it all together. Are there differences? between say the British and the French. And at the beginning, I didn't have enough data to really talk about that. And I don't know if there's a, such a thing as enough data, um, but I think we have something fun to say here today. And if you don't know about my work, there'll be a few slides at the beginning that will just sort of give a, a little bit of an overview. So without further ado, um, and, and I did schedule by the way, some time for questions at the end, but if we don't, have an opportunity to get to your question, um, then what I suggest is, uh, well, we're going to save the dialogue, hopefully, and then the, the chat dialogue, and then we can all go through that. Okay. So, um, yeah. So just to tell you a little bit uh, about what I do is I look at people's brains and brain activity, and uh, usually using a lab environment. So, we can see some folks here, they're wearing this red cap. There are some other caps now. Uh, my colleague in France is uh, using a more sophisticated wireless one that's sort of the, the newest technology with 50% more sensors. So uh, that's really been fun to work with. And we have people in, in the spirit of type doing not just one task or two or three, but a whole suite of things to stimulate the brain in different ways. So yes, doing calculations and meditating or you know, giving a little speech, but also drawing, using the imagination, listening to music, uh, sorting values, responding to an ethics situation. So there's really a variety of things and they might just do 10 tasks for about 35 minutes um, or they might do about 20 tasks. I've been doing fewer lately because we still get a lot of information. Uh, and, and the typical for this kind of technology is actually 12 minutes. So uh, I, I don't think we can really stimulate the brains in all the ways people like just in 12 minutes, but 30 minutes seems to be okay. So one of the things that came out of this um, more than a decade ago was noticing patterns among people. At that time, I didn't have enough data for each of the 16 types. So I grouped them by dominant function. Uh, and some other ways, but really dominant function is what popped out. And, and we can look at the brain in different ways, you know, like uh, just the different parts of the brain and how they light up, how they get active or are quiet as people do different tasks. And it could be task specific, but it also turns out brain activity is person specific. It's type specific. specific. And as we're going to see also career uh, and maybe a little bit of nationality specific. Another thing that we can look at is uh, what gets the brain into a state of flow. When all of the regions are sort of like, not like this, they could be, but they start to synchronize. And what is the kind of task that get people into this synchronized place? So is just drawing upon what I learned. And for the most part, I mean, I would really say like 90, 95% that matched the, the definitions of the functions, uh, or at least, you know, the flesh them out in a little bit different way that was, maybe we didn't, we, we would talk about, but not really give emphasis to. Um, 
And, and so there we have it with the brain activity. And then I began after the first 65 college students in Los Angeles um, to really branch out. So now we, it's coincidental, I, I added up all of the folks and there are exactly 500 records um, in the database as of today. And these are people from all different ages. Uh, there is a bias towards people who are type knowledgeable and who are using type, but otherwise many different professions. Uh, and we'll look at some of the, the other demographic data and see what's there. Now, one way we can um, look at the data is, by, is like social network is by looking at how different regions talk to each other, how they cooperate with each other as a group. So here we see two bird's eye view of the brain. And uh, the, the, little, the little pyramid you see, the little half triangle you see at the top of each one is uh, the nose. And um, uh, actually, I, I, well, let's see. I don't know if it allows me to hide the slide controls. Um, no, that's bizarre that they actually put the controls exactly over the screen. Um, yeah, I, I'm not actually sure entirely how to, I, I rarely use Windows machines, but I have to use Windows today. Um, and if anybody knows how to hide what is obviously a terrible ergonomics error on their part. Yeah, maybe the, the square box, uh, Dario. Does that help? Nope. No, it doesn't. Okay. No. No. Um, yeah, I just figured it would be something easy like on a Mac where you just click close and it goes away. But uh, like Bill Gates, it never goes away. Um, so uh, I'll just have to say what's on the title then. So this is two views of people who um, identify with the same type. And uh, this is something that I started to look at is these different social networks that people have. And by the way, Marky, if you do know how to use Windows or anybody else and you know how to close this, please, by all means, share that with me in the chat. Uh, I would love that. Um, so here we have uh, in 2018, no, hitting escape actually closed the, uh, the chat window instead, uh, unfortunately. So um, yeah, full screen, the double arrow. No, no, it just assumes that you want a bar in the middle of your picture, no matter what. Uh, welcome to Microsoft. Yeah, okay. I mean, we can do this. Uh, I know what's there. So digging deep. So I am looking at these two variations here among people who identify with the same type. And generally speaking, I was comparing people of different types. But when we have 30, 40, 60, 65 people of the same type, then we can begin to sort them in different ways. So a few years ago, I started analyzing the brain wiring differences among people of the same type. And I noticed patterns. For example, among ENFPs, we could sort them into subgroups. We could sort them by career. Um, we could sort them by male and female. We could sort them by cultural background. Uh, for example, like American or US American or not, uh, age and so forth. And in this case, I sorted these two groups. These are based on career. So the one on the left, this pattern is um, individuals who were more in science, technology, law, business, uh, those a little bit more what we might think of as analytic or yang kind of professions. Um, I didn't originally use yin and yang as uh, terminology, but the French Type Association convinced me that actually that was quite understandable to people and fairly accurate. So I, I do mention that as an option. And so we sorted for those people. And then there were other ENFPs who were then in social service, humanities, the arts, um, any, any kind of humanitarian kind of activity. And what we see here is sort of interesting. 
that the folks on the right have this very strong black pattern here. No, th this like starburst pattern that comes from the center there. It it's a little bit stylized. And if you're wondering, by the way, the red and the black are like the most active regions, uh, meaning like the, the most active strong connections. And then the gray and the yellow sort of in the background, that those are weaker connections that are there. Um, they're, still, they're, they're still strengths, but they're like secondary strengths. So we see on the right for those ENFPs who are sort of in the, when we say like the soft sciences, the arts, the humanities, social service, that they have the strong starburst pattern, which means that all of the regions are firing simultaneously um, in, in sync with each other. And that leads to a very was sort of like holistic way of thinking about things. Information comes in and the whole brain gets engaged with that in some way. Uh, then and there are some other patterns which are there sort of in the background. Then we look at those ENFPs who are in the hard sciences, business law, engineering, and so on. And they have a different pattern, but it's actually not that different because there's this gray, uh, if you look sort of carefully there, there is the starburst pattern, but it's gray, it's weaker, it's in the background. And then you have some other connections which are red and black, and those connections connect regions that make sense for ENFPs in terms of the skills that would serve well their psychological needs. Um, and those are more in the foreground. And then if we go back and look on the right, at the, the more holistic style, ENFP, and we look at the gray connections, for example, down in the right corner, there's this like little trapezoid-like shape that's in gray with a tiny bit of red. And then we see it's actually black with a tiny bit of red and it's much more obvious on the left side. And so it's the same pattern, exactly the same pattern, except one is in the foreground and one is in the background. So what this got me thinking is that we can sort people of the same type into subgroups. And that could be, you know, by male and female, it could be by career area. Um, it could be really by any two variables or in fact, three or four variables. Okay, we can certainly do that. So the idea was, is that we also don't lose the pattern that's there, is that really there are several patterns and that the question is what is coming to the foreground or what is uh, going to the background. And, um, and that's, that's uh, you know, what got me started a few years ago. So when, when I wanted to go further in the last year or two is I, I began to look at the research of some other people. One of them is Dr. Helen Fisher, uh, who is not in the type community. Um, I mean, she knows who I am and, uh, you know, sort of what we're doing. Uh, I, I really am interested in her stuff. She's a neuroscientist. She works looking at hormone and neurotransmitter levels. And she describes four broad personality patterns based on something that's fairly physiological rather than psychological. So we would expect because you might meet say three, four, five ENFPs and they're gonna have different body types. It's not like every ENFP you meet is a skinny ENFP, like skinniness defines ENFP. Like that, that's not a characteristic at all. Um, there might be very subtle things about body language and movement and energy and emotion, and then that's more interaction style. But what she's looking at here is, is a little bit different. It's a little bit physiological in nature. Then there's, um, well, you know, speaking of uh, current events, there's a Ukrainian psychologist who's very well known in Eastern Europe and Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and he describes four subtypes for each of the 16 types. And he's actually taken the effort, he and his co-author could, because he doesn't speak English, um, creating 64 portraits. And he comes from the Socionic school. So that's inspired by Jung. It's like the Eastern European Russian version of type rather than America and, you know, the, our, the, the Britain and so on have the, the Myers-Briggs version of type. So there are differences, but one of the things that really motivated him is he observed that the way, for example, ISFPs were described in the Eastern European literature was very different than the way they were described in tone. Um, 
to the sort of creative uh, free child kind of description that we might see in, in many, uh, not necessarily Myers-Briggs, but, but many of the Western type descriptions. So he really wanted to understand, well, maybe there are two different kinds of ISFPs. And in the West, they're emphasizing one version. And in the East, they're emphasizing another. And, uh, but then he didn't stop at two. He said, you know, four really, and, and we'll see why in a moment. And then from China, there's a colleague of mine, Jirhan. Uh, he's, uh, his background is cultural psychology and business. And he draws upon the work of Richard Nisbet um, to describe, uh, and he's been working separately. He has 64 descriptions in Chinese uh, that describe four different versions of each type, but they're Chinese versions. So do not this, this descriptions, but the whole style uh, has this like a Chinese style to it. He's, he said, because for himself, when he was in school in the United States uh, as an undergrad, he took the MBTI in English and he, he scored as an ENFJ or sorted as an ENFJ. Um, which didn't feel quite right to him. And then when he went back to China and took the Chinese version of the MBTI, he scored as INTJ. And that gives us a sense then we're talking about two letters difference. So e even in just that, that sort of Myers-Briggs parts, E-I-S-N-T-F-J-P, there really is a cultural difference that's there that needs to be accounted for. And then a number of you may know Dr. Mina Barmani at the Johns Hopkins and looking at the cognitive processes assessment um, and all the statistical research there, really, really great work. Uh, I appreciate what she's been doing for developmental subtypes for each dominant function. A little bit different than for each type, but for each dominant function. So long story short, before we get into the, the, the cross-cultural aspect, the global aspect is that we, we're going to talk about four subtypes or variants. Um, I feel that the word variant is technically more accurate because each of these is, is not really like a smaller box within a big box, uh, which is what the word subtype suggests. The variant is more like, you know, there are certain themes for each type. There's a pattern to each type, and these are simply variations, small variations on the pattern of how the person comes to express their, their psychological pattern, their psychological processes. That said, the word subtypes really is easy to communicate. And as some of you may know, the word variant is a little overused in the past few years. Um, it's appeared in the news a lot. So it has a little bit of baggage, that word. Uh, and I will continue to use both. So the idea is that among people of the same type, we can sort their brain wiring into four broad categories. I actually have enough data for some of them to sort even more to six or eight categories, but there, I, I don't think there's really a big reason to do that um, because then we can just rank these one, two, you know, first, second, third, fourth. So what, what are they? Instead of trying to give fancy definitions to them, I mean, I'm using these terms and these terms uh, are borrowed with permission from Dr. Victor Galenko, uh, dominant or, or sometimes called assertive, uh, creative, harmonizing, and normalizing. And they also relate very strongly to um, Dr. Helen Fisher's four categories where dominant relates to testosterone. And this is the relative amount of testosterone. So there are women, women, yes, uh, produce testosterone or females produce testosterone and some females produce more testosterone than others. Um, it's also a stand-in for really several different hormones when we talk about these. So we won't just talk, they're not just four hormones, you know, there, there's uh, adrenaline and acetylcholine and all of these other things. But just to keep it simple, we'll talk about the one. Uh, and then the creative is dopamine. So it's looking for that dopamine hit and is more exploratory and sociable, more, whereas the, the dominant version is more confident and driven. And then the harmonizing is oxytocin or estrogen. And oxytocin is that hormone that when we touch each other, that the more of that hormone is released by the act of physical touch itself. And, and the style, I mean, both Helen Fisher and Victor Galenko 
independently describe this as more empathic, more reflective, more in a relator role. And the normalizing is more conventional, more specialized, it's serotonin. And there's a whole bunch of features uh, around serotonin, like attending to the welfare of the group um, and a little bit more of a supporter role. And the reason I say these roles is not because a person, you know, if a person is a dominant variant, that doesn't mean that they are in a leader role. It could be that they're striving for a leader role. Um, but these come out of the demographics where I gathered a lot of information about people's uh, careers and their education and so on. And then, you know, digging a little bit further and seeing, yeah, are they in a leader role? How do they act? So to give an example, and I know some of you have seen this one before, um, but I will bring out this, uh, this pony again, four flavors of INTP. So the dominant style, I might call that the ambitious strategist is more confident and driven than other INTPs. So there's just a confidence and drive. So this might be this corporate strategist, with the sort of critical caustic style at times, uh, but also very savvy and very comfortable with the levers of power and not just being in organizations, but leading in the organizations. Uh, of course, when they're younger, they're not going to necessarily be in such a position, but they, they will still have that confident driven style. Then there's the curious investigator with the creative the creative variant is more uh, exploratory, more creative, more sociable than other INTPs. So you might think of like the humorous writer who can engage people on a wide variety of subjects. So this person is gonna come off as probably more extroverted than they really are. Their extroverted intuiting goofiness will often be on display, um, but don't mistake that. You know, There still is the strong introverted thinking core. And it, you know the, the way each function expresses within each, we could talk about that we're not, that would be for some, for some other time, but we could do that. The, the exacting designers are called the normalizing is more conventional, more specialized. And then might be like the quiet computer software engineer in a large organization. And I say might um, because there, there is, uh, you know, we, we don't want to be deterministic about it. On the other hand, there is all of this data that when people who had this brain wiring style and you look at what kind of job they had and what kind of career, it's like, well, then that matches pretty well. Uh, then we have this caring theorist is more empathic and reflective than other INTPs. Uh, so a therapist who helps individuals think clearly and function in a more satisfying way. And that is uh, run through for for INTP and each of their brain wiring patterns are quite different and we can easily rank them like somebody could be dominant first and creative second or harmonizing first and normalizing second or creative first harmonizing second, whatever it is to allow us to get at the actual mix of brain wiring that's there. Uh, in the, the deck, I have a second example for ISFP. So if you all look at the deck later, you can see this, but in the meantime, uh, I want to jump to, um, our international sample. And uh, I have two different numbers. So I said 500 because I have 470 unique individuals, but I have 500 records because it turns out there were, uh, I, I didn't realize it sort of did add up. There are 30 people who redid the brain imaging at some point. So it's a little bit of longitudinal data. Um, and that just coincidentally, I mean, it, nice round numbers for today, but the next person who comes in, then it will no longer be nice round numbers. Uh, I have three more people next week here in Norway. Um, so I want to use the brain imaging to understand the links between age, career, uh, culture, personality, sex, skills, and the developed self. And to cast a wider net than Los Angeles University and wider than the United States. And over the last few years, I've been able to gather data for 25 to 45 people from each of these countries, Denmark, France, Norway, United Kingdom, and India. And um, in some cases, we'll group them together. And in some cases, we'll, we'll talk about them separately. And yeah, so I, the reason I put the United States, by the way, that the letter's a little bit larger is because the bulk of the people still come from there. Um, but the other countries, you know, do show up. 
And, and if you are not from one of these countries and you would love to, to see your country added to this at some point, it might be on my list. Uh, I really want to get Japan here. Um, and, uh, you know, at the very least, not to mention a couple of other places, maybe one in Latin America, one in Africa, uh, in the Middle East would be fantastic. So one of the things that I was curious about right away was um, just this analytic versus holistic and ethnicity. So instead of trying to break them into four variants or subtypes, I'm like, let's just look at these broad things like we did with the ENFPs in the beginning. Either they're in you know, science and technology and this and that, uh, business law, or they're in social sciences and arts and humanities and so on. And just not even looking at their jobs, looking at the actual brain wiring, what do we see? So we can, we can break them into small groups or large groups. I, I break them in this way in part because they fit on the slide and because they illustrate a nice point. So the, the Americans, US Americans of European descent, 284 subjects, then white Europeans and almost all the people I had from Europe uh, were here, 82 people. And these are good numbers for neuroscience um, with a little caveat, which I'll say in a moment. Uh, then from the United States, individuals of other backgrounds. So those were mainly, uh, you know, they were African-Americans, Chinese Americans, uh, Indian Americans, Persian Americans, and Hispanic, the biggest group being Hispanic. Um, and those were 108 people. And then the folks from India, we had 26 people from Mumbai. So what I found is that the demographics, uh, one is that age, sex, and career were roughly equal. In other words, you have people from different career backgrounds and so on uh, from these different areas here, except that India, the, the, what we gathered was more business and technology people. At first glance, it looks like here the blue is the holistic and the orange is the analytic. And we might think that, wow, these Europeans here, these white Europeans are like super holistic. Um, that's something that we notice. And then with the Americans, white Americans, then that was 50-50. Like not exactly 50-50, but it's like very close. Um, and that's actually the largest sample size. Then there were these other two, which had um, other individuals from other backgrounds besides Europe and the United States were more likely sort of like, you know, 60 to 38, something like that, to have more of an analytic style. And then for those in India, keeping in mind they had business and technology background a little bit more, were much more likely to be analytical. So this was just a write-off impression. And, and there were some little bit of details like among Americans who have a holistic style of which there are a lot, white Americans, um, they tend to be the creative variant. In other words, that like brainstorm of dopamine and like going for the rush and exploring and having, you know, sort of amusement and variation. Like there, there really is a thing. In fact, the, the harmonizing style of brain wiring, which is these complex networks that cross over the hemispheres is so rare among Americans that the first few times I ran into it, I thought the equipment was malfunctioning. And then I came to Europe and particularly continental Europe. And it was like every other person, young people, old people, like whatever it was, not everyone, of course, but it was like every other person. And, and so even then, when we talk about what kind of holistic or what kind of analytic that tends to vary. So when Americans are holistic style, it's this fun loving, creative, I'll entertain ideas. And for Europeans, it's this harmon, tends to be more of this harmonizing, one-on-one, -on -one, sophisticated um, style, to, just to contrast those two little points there. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I also have like a little sample of about 20 people in France, the south of France, not in Paris, who are in business and technology. And they're also, they look just like the people in India. 
So I think this is a reminder that it's not just culture. I mean, these are large enough samples that it gives us some hypotheses. Um, but I think we're reminded again that, that career is still playing an important role, although culture does show up. And by culture, I'm sort of indicating like subcultures as well. You know, I mean, Europe to put everybody in Europe, so Italians and Germans, you know, in the same, uh, and, and uh, you know, Spanish and Polish and the so on. I mean, most of them are from Denmark, Norway, France, and the UK. Um, in fact, the UK folks matched a little bit more the Americans, <laughs> sorry to say, um, but uh, still they were different um, than, than that. Uh, and then I, I do want to mention there was a recent um, brain imaging meta study that was published just this past week, suggesting that significance in neuroscience studies often disappears when you increase the sample size. And they, they, they postulated based on the, the meta study that you need samples of at least 3000 people from brain imaging uh, on average, well, not on average, but um, to assuredly get results that will stand, you know, test, retest. They did say 500 and above was a number that you're probably good, but you can't be 100%. Um, that still there were studies with 500 plus or minus that, that did not pan out. And I think that design of the studies, of course, has something to do with it. So I'm very aware that these numbers here may not be as meaningful as they look, and I wanna emphasize that. Um, as, as well as one other little detail here, which fascinated me, that there is this idea, uh, which I read about now and again over the decades, that somehow Europeans and Americans share the similar Western culture. And in a sense, they do, of course. Um, but actually, the, the patterns of brain wiring, the, the landscape of brain wiring that's out there is, is actually fairly different between Europeans and, and Americans. And that, uh, especially because the harmonizing style just tends to be quieter to begin with, it's, it's a little bit like you know, Linda Barron's uh, behind the scenes interaction style. So they're gonna be a little bit quiet about it. Um, well, Americans are a little bit, uh, you know, get things going and everything. Then that, that may hide, that in kind of interaction may hide the fact that actually there are some deep neurological differences on average through these populations. Not to mention um, the differences, for example, if you had somebody from Europe, uh, white European, I, I'm thinking though that this is primarily cultural. I just say white European because that was the number of, it's like 98% of the people. Um, uh, then there was India and compare that to India and how different that would be. And what kind of culture clash there can happen when people come with very different brain wiring. So I know it's a little bit controversial and at the same time, I'm very happy to say that, you know, with these kinds of sample sizes, we'll see, you know, we'll see. Uh, but I thought I would present actually the most like juicy thing in a way first, the most sort of like provocative thing. Um, and, and a reminder, by the way, that every single country, every single ethnic group, every single type has all four variants present, at least like 15%, you know, as opposed to the statistical average, which would be 25%. So there's the, these things are like, do they even matter anyway? You know, these are very variations within the landscape of the, the population. And that's, uh, I mean, at the least, I suppose it suggests when we gather in the type community that, that American type professionals and European type professionals may actually have different brain wiring. And um, I mean, the data seems to suggest that. So what are some other things that I looked at? Um, so one thing I, I really felt was important, I was inspired by a study done so like over 10 years ago at UCLA, a neuroscience study on female professors in the biology department. And their idea was, is they wanted to see like similarities and differences. And they, they, they had some 
sort of overall goal in mind and hypothesis. I don't remember what it was because it's, it's been a while. Um, but what they didn't do is they didn't look at personality as a variable. They didn't even use five factor approach. And so I think all of us as type users would immediately think, well, hmm, they're going to biology university faculty. How many of those faculty have a thinking preference? We can look at actually the MBTI manual and at research studies and find out what is likely going to be the statistical distribution of types. And that is not going to be probably in line with the general population. So that if one were to test women or men, uh, students, workers, uh, different kinds of workers in different professions, and then make broad statements about all people in that group without at least adjusting for personality. And not even saying using type, like even using five factor or, or uh, temperament, uh, the, some other model, DISC, uh, they don't even do that. So I really wanted to, to look and see that type is this really great lens to understand what kind of uneven sample do we have. And so I looked here, and, and this at the upper left, um, I'm just going to zoom in because this the whole Windows interface is just, um, you know, it, it's a shame, that it, and I suppose maybe it's inevitable. We can't sue people over bad design, but... Um, if that were a thing, it's like the fashion police, but for computers. Um, so here we have E and I, S and N, T and F, J and P with the, the first letter E, S, T, J being in the orange and then the I and F, P being in the turquoise. And you can see that in this whole uh, sample that I, N, F and P as individual preferences were overrepresented. Um, a little bit more J than P is in line with the general population. Uh, e and I are not terribly different, but S uh, and N are quite different. So the, 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 I might want to say modal type, but it's actually the modal type preferences, um, not the type itself. Because as we dig deeper, we'll see that actually INFPs were not the most frequent. If we just even look at male versus female, we'll see that then the modal preferences would be INTP for males and um, ENF, J or P is like right, right on the line uh, for females. So I, I know going forward, I need to adjust a lot to account for the fact that my sample does not match the American or the global sample, uh, especially in terms of intuiting versus sensing. Then we can break it down and look at male versus female and we'll see that uh, the, the, uh, we have mauve and, uh, well, I meant that to be turquoise, but I guess that ended up as blue. Um, so extroverting, introverting, they're right the same, but the males tended to be more introverted. Um, sensing, the males were more sensing, intuiting is sort of close, thinking males far more uh, present, um, thinking preference males over females and so on, and then perceiving, and, and we'll find out in the end why this is, because I had a whole lot of SP males um, among the SPs, whereas the other types were pretty more or less evenly represented. So I just mention this, not because I'm trying to prove any particular point, but to say that bias in the sample matters a lot and how powerful type is and reminding us that we need to adjust whatever we're doing. And then I looked at the eight uh, Jungian function attitudes or cognitive processes, and we see that extroverted sensing and introverted thinking are relatively highest for males, and uh, extroverted feeling and introverted intuiting are relatively the highest for, for females. And um, that's, that's what we got with that. So I'm just wanting, I, and now after I, I gave this little like little piece back here, which I know people probably wanted to hear about, regardless of how they take it, um, that, uh, and, and I don't take it too seriously, by the way, I just think it's interesting, that's it. Uh, and this here is then like, we must necessarily do this step in order to know. Now, this part here is then going in deeper. And um, this, uh, this on the, the left, is just looking for each of the 16 types, doing a breakdown, and which was more present, males or females for that type. And many of them were close, but I highlight in color the ones that 
uh, were, were different. Um, and so we have uh, among the NTs, males are represented more than females, which matches the MBTI data. Um, then for NFs, uh, females are represented more than males, although the NFPs are quite close and it's really the NFJs that are, are further different. And, and this mostly, I mean, it's in the direction of the MBTI data. Then weirdly, we have for ESTJs, uh, a fair number of female ESTJs represented, but not males. I found it very difficult to get um, ESTJ and ESTP folks to participate. Um, whereas say like ISTJ and ISFJ, th there were plenty of, of people who would volunteer. Um, and then for the other SJs, um, males were more represented, especially for ISFJ, which is not normal. It's way out of pattern for the general population. So something to keep in mind. And then for the, ST, for the SPs, all males overly represented. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, but this is something about the research data and it's just something I'll have to, to deal with in the future. Finally, um, the last piece of like it to step through before we get it at like another level of, uh, of exploring is looking at the, the four variants or subtypes. And there are, um, if we look at the NTs, we see that those which, you know, it, it's all like for ENTJ, 48% had the dominant wiring pattern, 33% had the normalizing pattern, 10% had the creative pattern, and 10% had the harmonizing pattern. So clearly the 48% stands out. The dominant ENTJ is like the Jeff Bezos version of ENTJ. I, I don't know what his actual type is, but I think he's a good example to use uh, or, or an illustrative example. Um, whereas INTJ, only 14% scored with the dominant pattern, 30% with normalizing, 36% with creative and 20% with harmonizing. And it's very interesting that we see with this dominant pattern is it predominates with ENTJ and INTP who are both dominant thinking types. And then for INTJ and ENTP, it's the creative style that predominates. And they're both dominant perceiving types, dominant intuition. We see something very similar, not quite as crisp with the NFs. Um, ENFJ and, and uh, INFP, uh, have a strong and dominant style. Although the INFP also has a big step into creative. And, and I imagine you INFPs, you can probably relate to that, that there is both analytical component to INFP that can be quite, um, you know, on mission and, and doing what it takes to, to learn and speak and decide on mission. And then there is this creative side, this idea of exploring and entertaining and so on. Um, and by the way, you know, if we looked at a second one for INTP, they, that was also their creative was their secondary style. So um, in terms of the brain wiring. And then for INFJ and ENFP is again, their dominant intuiting types. And it was the creative style that was the most. Keep in mind though, even though I'm highlighting these percentages that everybody, every type showed these patterns. So when people ask me, what's the relationship between type and brain wiring? I'm like, it's statistical. And this is only one of three or four ways to look at brain activity. And this way is the way that's the, like the most different, but um, still we see these variations with type. And then this was really, I, I grouped SJ and SP. So the SJ folks, STJ, who have the directing style are this dominant analytic. And then for the SFJs, this holistic style, feeling preference, also informing communication style, then is the creative one. And, and uh, you know, ESFJ also harmonizing and normalizing too, pretty close. And then for here, I don't know what to do with the SP data because it was so skewed toward male uh, SPs. Um, and you can see that they pretty much like there's 29, 29, 20, like they just score pretty evenly across the board um for for whatever reason so i i sort of highlight this because 
is just a reminder. Some people ask me, they're like, but I thought that the neuroscience like proved type. And I'm like, well, in a statistical sense, yes, but you can't say because this person has this, say, starburst pattern, that that means that they're a dominant intuiting type or something like that. Um, that that's, uh, that's what we have is these, you know, statistical correlations that are there. And, and I could show more, but I'm not going to be labor with all of that because then this just becomes very technical. I, I do want to mention some things that go back to, to what we started about and just diving into one piece, demographics for INTJ in particular. And I could go through and do this for each type I haven't done even most of the types yet, but this is the example that's worked up, is showing like career areas. Where do INTJs tend to be? Well, in science and technology, also in media arts and psychology and HR. Not really a surprise because there are INTJs here in this audience and you have an interest in type and psychology, but also physics and um, you know, like five other topics. Then handedness, and this was important to see, handedness is 90%, 10% versus right versus left-handed, just like the general population. Distribution by sex was uh, a little bit more extreme than the general population, but we do know there are more male than female folks with, a, with INTJ preferences. Um, the age cohort was primarily age 25 to, to 55. So we grew out of just talking about college students. And then for distribution by race, uh, and race I'm just using as a general statement here because you know Hispanic is an ethnic group uh, and the individuals can be of any race and ethnic group. Um, that what we see is that one, that this is fairly close. When you count the fact that the database includes a fair number of Europeans, um, that this is fairly close to what we expect statistically in the general population. And it's a reminder that type transcends many differences, that INTJs and ESFPs and ISTJs and so on appear in all nations, all ethnic groups, uh, more or less equally. Uh, not exactly equally. We know that there are some differences by country, but those differences are, you know, is the same with brain wiring. All of them appear you know, some a little bit more or less than others, but all of them appear as really very nice. Um, and then brain wiring patterns, there's like different ones on the left, but I just wanna highlight one, the one that's the strongest, which is the starburst pattern. That's the, the one associated with creative style, creative subtype, um, that this starburst pattern is something that I was surprised by increases with age rather than decreases. I had sort of thought from my own hypothesis, my null hypothesis was that it starts off large when people are young, the starburst pattern, and it decreases as people specialize and become more risk adverse as they get older. But apparently that's not the case, at least for INTJs, that actually the type becomes more holistic, uh, which is really fascinating in terms of type development. Does that mean that the individual is like every act of growth is also simply adding to the introverted intuiting pot that is their dominant function? You know, is there, we can add many items to the plate and is that just making the plate bigger and that plate is still called introverted intuiting? So that's, uh, I found that very interesting. And then I found nationality versus starburst score that individuals of all uh, ethnic backgrounds in the United States were more likely, twice as likely to show a starburst pattern than individuals uh, from Europe or India, which suggests that there is a Europe, there, there is an American spirit of this dopamine driven exploratory style that's there. And that doesn't matter what the person's ethnic group or background is, um, that it transcends that. And that is sort of interesting to see as well. So uh, one more piece I want to, to talk about, and this is very much a cultural piece. Um, when, 
my colleagues, Johan contacted me. Uh, he's at UCLA, he's a UCLA postdoc student now. Um, uh, and, and we've met at, uh, in Los Angeles, but he contacted me and um, he's from China originally. And he had come up with the, the, not just four subtypes for each type, but four subtypes for each function, Jungian function type or cognitive process. So, and this is an example of extroverted sensing. So in my work, I started just talking about analytic holistic for extroverted sensing, introverted sensing, and the other functions. And Jirhan came and he said, you know, in China, the functions show up differently. And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, in China, we really have the blue and the yellow here. And he's like, you see this in mythology. We see this in the data we've been gathering statistically from people. You see this in the news media, like who, who is the popular film characters? And he said an example could be an ESFP or ESTP hero character, and they have a normalizing style. Normalizing normally means conventional and specialized, but what, what does that mean in this case? That means that they have a participant role, that they like to engage the group in fun, tangible activities. And he said in contrast to that, in Chinese Median mythology is the adventurer extroverted sensing. So the adventurer ESFP or ESTP, who's curious, who's pleasure seeking, who's rebellious, who's a traveler from one town or city to the next, um, the one who bucks the rules. And he said this, this blue yellow uh, dichotomy here is very strong in Chinese culture. Whereas he said, especially the dominant style is discouraged. Although in general in China, there is like an undercurrent of the dominant style. Um, and harmonizing is like, no, it doesn't come across that way. Like you don't see extroverted sensing conveyed that way in, in Chinese culture. And we're not seeing it, he said, in our data that we've gathered either because they have an assessment for these subtypes in, for Chinese folks in Chinese. Um, and they said this is so interesting because my data showed like the red and the green. And just having just the red and the green would have given an incomplete picture that if we want a type framework that really captures the diversity of people culturally on a global scale, not just on an American scale. And as we've already discovered, like American and European have different brain wirings, like their landscapes are different. Yes, you're going to have two individuals randomly selected who might be quite similar, but the landscape is different. Never mind that. That they're really on a global scale that we, we can talk about. Yeah, you know, there are these different ways that type expresses and let's be in a dialogue and, and gather data and question and explore and make sure that when somebody is looking for their type and they're thinking, boy, am I an ESFP? No, I'm very group oriented. I must be an ESFJ. It's like, no, your culture is a collectivist culture. You can have normalizing extroverted sensing. You have the participant style of extroverted sensing. I mean, I'm not going to tell them that it's for them to discover, um, but it creates room for people to discover their best fit type in a way that they might have not before. Uh, and that's what I see is the real power of the subtypes is, is applications help people better locate their best fit type. I've talked to several people now. There was one person who just contacted me. Uh, I mean, he had settled on INFJ more or less, but he kept scoring and thinking it was INTJ. He's like, no, he's just the dominant style of INFJ, of which there are. Um, it allows us to more closely coach and advise people, particularly around career choice, um, but also some multicultural workplace stuff and probably some relationship things as well. But the demographics uh, data is really quite clear about the career separation. In fact, even the size of the organizations that people are comfortable working in varies, but with their brain wiring. I mean, just even the size, that is in, regardless of what they're doing. Um, to demonstrate to people they have choices because brain wiring is something that can shift over the course of a few years, if we make an effort, a little effort even. Um, what about teams that have low diversity? This, this happened to me during COVID. 
I came in to co-facilitate a team that had 10, 11 people on it, and seven of them were ESTJ. And well, six ESTJs and one ISTJ. Uh, how are we supposed to, I, I mean, we can, but do we want to get more specific than that? Yes, we can get more specific than that. Um, reminder, as we know from the Minnesota multiphasic twins, the, the Minnesota twins uh, study, that genetics only account for 40 to 60% of the type preference variants. So that means 40 to 60% is nurture, is environment, is culture, um, it, gender roles, that kind of thing. Reconcile different authors and cultures takes on the 16 types like China versus Europe versus Eastern and Western Europe versus the United States versus India. Um, well, they're not really versus each other. It's just, you know, comparisons it, to help people understand why is it, oh yeah, I think I'm an ISFP but I don't match this like wild child's description here. Why, why is that? You know, I mean, David Kiersey Sr. in particular, and please understand me, some of the portraits of the SPs were, uh, I wouldn't say flattering, but they were a little bit, not always, but extreme. Um, so where does everybody else fit? So better understand how type expresses differently across cultures. And then some little parting thoughts. This is to summarize what we talked about. The brain imaging gives us a window into people's mental life and develop self. Um, we can account for a whole bunch of things, upbringing, environment, job roles, even the hormones in a coherent way. Uh, multiple sources, so four different sources and then myself, so five point to uh, distinct variants. And then we can rank them or we can visualize those points around a wheel. So they don't need to be sub boxes. And then um, if people wonder what subtype am I? Well, you can get a brain imaging session or you can also read descriptions. Um, and, and so I think that that's, uh, it becomes a great stereotype buster. It, it really does. Even if the person doesn't have the opportunity, they're, they're just reading or looking about, they're like, oh, right, that they're like different versions uh, of each type. Um, I don't think we want to overwhelm people. So in terms of resources, uh, there, are the all, there are portraits that are based upon the neuroimaging and demographic data. I finished those in February um, or early March and in February, end of February. And uh, I mean, 64 is a lot, but they're there and they're all based on, on the, the results of this research. And you can get them in either um, slide deck form or in like a handout form. It's eight and a half by 11, fairly close to A4. And that's, you can contact me, service at radiancehouse.com, or you can, I'll send you to my shared book site, which has these available. And they're eBooks, so like they're very cheap. So to wrap up, um, what's a big takeaway or actionable idea for you? Um, and uh, uh, which subgroup? Okay, so here's a little question since we do have a second. Uh, work in larger organizations, that would be the folks with more serotonin, that would be the normalizing group. And uh, when you go and read, like, say, ENFJ normalizing or INFP normalizing or, or you know, ISTP normalizing, you're like, oh, yeah, there are those people. Um, and they are their type, but they look different than me, or maybe they look very similar. Um, so just thinking about what are those actionable, an actionable idea, I have to thank Jane Kizzy for asking this kind of question. And normally I'd say Q&A, well, you know what, email me, uh, because we're at the top of the hour. And, um, and then there's the little piece about me, but yeah. So that's, uh, that's today. With, uh, which is a little bit of a brain dump, but um, I didn't want to just make broad statements. I wanted to show that there really was data behind it and what it takes in order to be able to say something that's even speculative or a hypothesis. Are the slides available to us? Um, yes, uh, well, I don't know what, um, BAP's policy is, but if you want the slides, you can, you can also email me.
Yeah, so Dar, if you email me the slides, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to put them on the hub, so they'll be on there tomorrow if everybody wants. So. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dario. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat to see if there were any other quick questions. Um, there was a comment from Rob. I don't know if Rob's still on the, still on the call. Do you, is there anything you'd like to say, Rob? Yeah, my question was around, um, you know, Dari, your experience when people are reading their best fit type description uh, in different cultures, what's the sort of range of resonance that you're seeing based on some of the other things you're describing here today? Uh, well, it's it's not something that I've looked at formally because I, I don't run like type introduction workshops, but I can say from the people who've come in who are not settled on their type, like come into the lab and are not settled and are debating. One of the, the biggest breaks is between their skill set and their type. So we often end up describing the types in terms of behaviors, which means skills. So uh, David Kersey went as far as to say, like, if you're in the sciences and engineering and so on, you're probably an NT. I, I don't agree, um, but it can be confusing. Um, and I, I, that is, I found one of those things that makes a difference. And then the other is when there's a stark cultural difference. Um, an example in Norway, for example, is we have three ESFPs who work in our immediate office. Um, all of them, I mean, they've gone through type, the two of them are type facilitators uh, with clients. And um, they say they have difficulties with the ESFP descriptions that are written in America. Uh, because they describe this fun-loving entertainer. And while they do like fun, they're like, I don't view myself as an entertainer. And that's because for the most part, they're not this creative subtype. They're harmonizing or normalizing subtype. And um, that I, I think the entertainment piece is what comes with the Americanized version of ESFP and, and even a stereotype of ESFP. As an ES ESFP myself, I <laughs> I understand that you're often often seen as the entertainer. It, it it's less about that. It's more about the fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Good Great. Okay. Thank you all very much. So the slides and the recording will be published on the hub tomorrow. And uh, yeah, thank you all for for joining us today. No, thank you. Thank you.